Up next on All About the Gear, I'm here with Frederick Van Johnson and a special secret guest to look at an unusual camera, the new DX01 on the TWIP network. I'm here with another episode of All About the Gear with my my old good friend, Frederick Van Johnson. How you doing, Frederick? I'm doing good, Doug. How are you doing? Good. And uh, we've got another special guest here who's never been on our show, although I've been on his old show this week in photo, Mr. Alex Lindsay. How are you, Alex? Uh, I'm doing well. Good to be here. Thanks it, so much. it is great to see you here. Now, I've got both of you here for an unusual reason. That is, you guys have a camera that I've never even seen or touched and that's the DX01. Frederick, what is this thing? The DX01, well, first let me start off by saying that uh, many, many years ago, Alex Lindsay predicted, or I don't know if it was a prediction, but it was more of a wish. A dream. That it was, I, I had a dream. <laughs> he had a dream. And that dream was one day that uh, camera manufacturers would understand that the power of the LCD in the phone and the computational you know, acumen in these smart devices that we have is half of the equation. And all you need to do is add cool optics to it, and you'd have an awesome camera, a pocketable camera. We'll fast forward to today, and we've got this thing, which is the DxO1. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty cool camera, which we'll dive into, I think. And But, Doug, to answer your question, at its core, like I said, it's a camera that you plug into your iPhone, specifically a 6 or a 6 Plus or an iPad with a lightning connector, and boom, it becomes what DxO says is a DSLR quality camera. We're going to talk about that a little bit, though. Yeah, so Alex, I can remember on This Week in Photo, it seemed like week after week after week, you were pleading for this, something like <laughs> this. You, you basically wanted a, a, a totally soft camera. Sony came out with the QX10 and the QX100, which we reviewed on All About the Gear, and I remember and saying, I here's Alex Lindsay's camera. So, and, and, um, and what, it, what was funny was is that I it is that I bought those immediately, you know, and and I was very excited about them. Um, and the the problem was is again the wireless connection was a little bit you know difficult to set up and put together, and the quality was okay. And and so it was one of those things that that uh, you know for me I just felt like I'm already carrying my phone around. Um, I spend a lot of time in the air, um, and my 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 kit is already very. Uh, packed, you know, my my uh, typically um, my backpack is already 40, 45 pounds, and right. I've got a, you know, I've got just enough to last in my in my carry on, and so so it was always like this. I'm not going to put an SLR in, and then even a three, even a, a four thirds camera was too big, and so so I was really just dying for something that I can carry around all the time, and whether and I'm you know wherever I'm traveling, I can just pull it out and shoot with it, or I can shoot my kids. I can you know I know I don't feel like I'm lugging something with me every single time, but I still want to get great photos, and I didn't need it to be as good as SLR, but very close to it. Something that's better than what my iPhone's doing. Yeah. Which, which you know, to be honest, I mean, you guys seen the billboards around the Bay Area. The iPhone camera by itself is pretty good, which, yeah. I, think, which I think is part of the marketing uh, challenge that DxO has. Because a lot of people will look and say, hey, you know, look at all those billboards. Why do I need to spend this extra money to get better when I could make billboards like Apple does and I'm only sharing my stuff online? So that's, I think that's a challenge that they have, right? I think well, it is. No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I say, Frederick, um, why don't you just for a second, for those who are watching the video, show us how this mates with the iPhone. Yeah, yeah, let's absolutely. Just make sure we, so, let's make sure we have the concepts down here. So when you pull it out of your pocket, it looks like this, right? That's it. And I know these webcams kind of distort size, so just for size comparison, there's my hand, right? So it fits in the palm of your hand. And to mate it to your, uh, to your phone... You basically just open it, and this action opens it. This one swift action opens, turns on the camera. So now the camera is on, and I could take photos right now by just pressing the button. You know, kind of in covert stealth mode. And There's I do that a lot, button. by the way. There's a lot of places like airports where you, you know, picking up a big phone and everything else, especially when you're on the tarmac in Istanbul. Yep. Uh, yeah. Not something they're excited about you doing, but with this little guy, you just kind of hold on to it. Yeah, you hold on to it like this. There's no LCD. There's no bright light given, you know, giving away your position or anything. <laughs> and you just press the button, and you're taking photos. Now, if you want, but you're taking photos in the blind, right? So it's like, almost like a GoPro with no screen on it. Right. But if you want to connect it to your phone, then you the action is this is a spring-loaded lens cap. You press this down a little further. So yeah, you just slide that open, and boom, that guy pops out, which is the lightning connector. And then 
to put it on your Here's phone. Here's the magic. All right, watch it. You plug it in, and now this. The cool thing is when you plug it into your phone. Your, uh, you know, granted, if your phone is is awake, it will launch the DXL application immediately, and you're in camera mode at that point, so you can you can start shooting. And I think that nuance, from my perspective, especially contrasting it with the QX series from Sony, that's the important bit because it's the bit from I want to take a picture of my kid making his first steps to being ready to take the photo. That that distance, that time is critical. And with the QX, it's Take it out, pair it, clamp it on there, you know, all this stuff, and then you're ready maybe to take the photo. With this thing, it's kind of flip it out, stick it in there, and you're you're shooting. So it's a it's a quicker I want to take a photo to actually recording bits action. And Frederick, does does that thing rotate also? It does, yeah. So this that's their patent pending mechanism there. So you can I forget what the what the actual rotational degree is. Alex, you know that, right? It's uh, sixty degrees either way. 60 degrees, yeah, so it rotates like that. And they have a selfie mode where if you flip it, if you flip it over and aim it at yourself, uh, the software will detect that you've done that and go into what they call selfie mode. So it'll do a countdown timer, and when it's ready to take your photo, it will put kind of a, it'll change your screen to kind of a warm glow to illuminate your face, you know, and then take the selfie. The negative of that, which I put in the notes, is the, the fact that selfie mode doesn't work in... Um, it doesn't work in video mode, which is because I look at this thing. I'm like, this would be ideal for YouTube vloggers, right? Because you walk around shooting video of yourself all the time. Now you don't have to carry a big rig; you just carry this thing. But they've disabled uh, video in selfie mode. Maybe that's coming because you know it could just be a firmware update. But right now, it's not. Uh, it's not active. So, Alex, um, does I guess the big question is, does this camera? meet the Alex Lindsay test in a way that the Sony QX10 and QX100 didn't? Yeah, I think that there's a couple things that that uh, are much closer to what you know what I was hoping to see, which is that a again the connection is very fast within yeah. seconds, within you know ten seconds of you looking at uh, something, you're you're ready to shoot a, an image, which I think is very very important. Um, also, um, I think that w the the speed of the lightning connector. Allows you to that that foot that's going onto your iPhotos or into your photos um, library immediately as you're shooting. So the JPEG version and, and what's cool is it's shooting in RAW or Super RAW, which is a low light mode. Um, and then the your um, JPEGs are being added to your your photos library or directly from the app. You can share them to Facebook and so on and so forth. So I just went I just got back from Rwanda and uh, I was shooting all the Facebook stuff on my way to Rwanda in Rwanda. Those were all shot on the DXO, on the DXO one, and uh, so that was my big test. And I probably shot two or three thousand photos total, and uploaded a couple of them. So um, in on on it, and um, uh, and so being able to do that quickly, and being able to post to Facebook, yeah. you know, it's a connected camera. You're posting to Facebook seconds after you shot, is is just incredible. You know, and I and I and I think that it's, you know, I think that that along with the the low light performance, which is pretty outrageous. I mean, I've been shooting some stuff where I was at a dinner with um, some folks in Rwanda and we were, I mean, it was dark, candle lit, dark, you know, at, at this Indian restaurant and I couldn't believe the photos I was taking. Like, it was just, you know, it was like, I cannot believe this, this, the low light performance is really good. And and so I think that's the, um, those two things, um, I think, really, really have it stand out. Yeah, um, and a new the other thing is, again, I'm oh, sorry, ahead. Alex, go ahead. All I was going to say is that the big thing that stands up over the over the Sony lenses is also just the size. I can't put those in my front pocket. I can't put them in my jeans pocket. I can't, you know, I can't just. They're still like carrying a camera around, you know, you know, and and so you know that's not. Um, they, you know, and I and I was, I mean, literally, I bought them the first day they came out, you know, and and it's just um, I never never ended up using them in any other than I tested, you know, <laughs> this is the worst part with me. I I bought it. I tested it for a week, and I probably should have done something with it, but I, you know, still sitting around somewhere gathering dust because I just I was just like, this isn't going to work. Yeah. And so, and so, this is the first one that I've had where I'm I'm carrying it every day, everywhere. It's it's pretty slick. Yeah. I think one nuance that you that you touched on there was just the dual recording, right? Because DxO, I think, really thought through. I mean, we'll we'll talk about the industrial design of this thing in a little in a little bit, but they I think they really thought through the. Uh, uh, you know, just how people are going to be using this. The the fact that you're connected to a connected device is primary. So now, when you shoot an image, it's going to record, like Alex said, either raw DxO raw or their their super raw format to the card in the camera, 
and then spit out the JPEG over to your phone because you know you can't do anything with a RAW over there, generally speaking. So they spit out a high resolution JPEG to your phone that you can then manipulate in Snapseed or whatever you want, and then put that on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. So you see, you know I think and, the net effect and, of it is you start getting these images that people are like, did you take that with a phone? Well, kind right. of. <laughs> well, and, and the thing is, is that you you have the immediacy of of having the iPhone there. You have the GPS information. One of the things that I do a lot of when I'm shooting images uh, with an old SLR, which now I now start really thinking like a <laughs> truck, um, is uh, is if they're not connected to GPS, I mean, you can buy a little thing for your Nikon that makes it GPS ready and some little point and shoots have it. I end up taking a picture of the same scene with my iPhone. You know, so I'll take a picture with the SLR if I'm traveling and take a picture with my iPhone because then I match those up later so that I know where I was. You know, so I have like, this is my GPS location, especially if I'm out in the woods or something like that. That's all already in the image. You know, so I, I have the advantage of shooting with, with the iPhone. Um, you know, I have all that data that's there. I'm able to to get that JPEG up quickly, but I still have raw, <laughs> which means that, that you know later I'm going to be able to go in, edit it, you know, do the color correction that I want to do, and it's not just going to be a JPEG that I that I shot. So the immediacy that you you want with your phone, but the quality, you know, an image quality or depth that you would want with uh, with your SLR. Yeah. So we we have to address a fundamental question here. This camera costs. Five hundred and ninety-nine dollars. So it costs roughly the same as most iPhones do. Mm -hmm. And the the real question is: All right, let me just take a look at the specs here. It's got a thirty-two millimeter equivalent lens, so it's just a little slightly narrower than the iPhone itself, which is, I think, around twenty-eight millimeters or so. Mm -hmm. uh, what what can you do with this? that you can't do with the iPhone itself because we all know that the iPhone 6 and particularly the 6 Plus have spectacular cameras in them. What, what's the difference? Alex I wanted to take that. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, they, uh, so there's, there's a couple things. One is the low light performance is dramatically better than the iPhone. So I mean it is, it, you know, so when you're, you, you really can shoot in almost any environment and you're going to get an image out of it, um, especially if you're with the super raw mode, um, you know, there's a lot of places where you can shoot those and you're, you're going to get a, a very usable image. Um, it's kind of a, it's very impressive. Secondly, the bokeh is a lot is a lot better. You know, so you 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 have a shorter depth of field when you're shooting. You can you know open it up to f f one eight. Uh, you can um, you know get get shoot a portrait. And I've shot some stuff with my kids, and it's just it's not it's not as short as if I'm using a you know 1.850 on a on on a um, you know my Nikon DSLR or my Canon DSLR. It's not going to be quite the same short depth of field. Uh, but it is definitely dramatically better than something I'm going to get on my iPhone. So if I want that, and then of course I'm getting raw. So the low light performance, the the bokeh that is much more. I mean, I bought an I bought a uh, M M8, you know, the HTC M8, and then Frederick and I did some stuff, a uh, video about that. Yeah. But I bought that um, because I wanted that short depth of field on a cellular phone, you know. And it was kind of weird because it's just kind of making it up. This is like real bokeh. <laughs> so so you get yeah. you get a raw image, you get real bokeh, and you get um, uh, and you get the low light performance. I think those are the big things that that this that this provides. Yeah, Frederick, what are you going to add to that? I would. I yeah. I can't really add anything to that. I the the thing that I would highlight though is that low light performance because that's that's where, at least with today's iPhones, that's where they they tend to start limping a little bit the darker it gets out there. And you do pretty well, but you know they they're gonna they're gonna uh, increase the shutter speed in order to, you know, get you get the light it needs to create the image, which. You know, if you're taking pictures of your kid in a darkened room and your kid has had some sugar, like last night, then they're going to be bouncing around. <laughs> they're going to be bouncing around a little bit, and you're going to get blurry shots of the kid, right? So it's the low light performance that you're that that this thing excels at. Um, the other thing that I want to hit on that that Alex has kind of brought up was that it's important. I think this is a this is a challenge for DxO again. It's important that when people look at this thing, it's a new category entirely, right? So it's not this is not, you're not going to look at this and say, okay, I'm going to get this and replace my DSLR. Even though they compare it to DSLRs in their marketing materials, you're not going to replace your DSLR or your mirrorless camera or anything with that. It's not that tool. It's a tool that you take with you when, it's like a professional camera. It's a professional's, I don't want to bring my big stuff camera. Right, so you have your iPhone with you all the time. In the old days, we would have had to bring a really capable small mirrorless camera with us if we wanted to get really good shots. Now you could still do that if you need the interchangeable lens function functionality. But now, if you don't need all that and you just like, okay, I just want to be covered in case something happens, you can throw this in your pocket. 
and still come away with, you know, Doug K, Alex Lindsay style images without worrying about, okay, I, you know, that was a great shot, but all I had was my iPhone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we Alex talked about the fact that it was pocketable. Um, it's the camera, you guys have said, it's the camera that you go out when you want to, don't want to take your big camera. But, of course, we've got things like the Sony RX100 that uh, we often use. Is there a is there a, a situation where you would take this over that if you already had a pocketable camera like an RX100? Frederick? Um yeah, that's a, that's a tough question, right? Because I don't like I say this on the show a lot. Well, uh, photographers get into this this binary mode where it's okay, I have to d get that or that. I think there's a room for both, right? If you can swing it, if you're Doug K and you can have both of these things, <laughs> you know, or Alex for them. <laughs> you know, you I think there's room for both. There's times when I would want to bring that RX100 with me, right? Cuz it's going to it's going to do things that this thing can't do. This is this is a really good camera. It doesn't have a whole lot of features like the RX100 has, but it excels at image quality and low light performance. So keep it in your car, throw it in your pocket when you're out and about. You don't want to bring all this stuff with you, and you can still come away with like professional quality images. But if you're on a photo walk or something, Doug, like you lead all the time in San Francisco and around the world, then of course, you're going to want to bring a more capable camera with you. But that, again, well, see, that's that's the challenge because that's not to say you couldn't do that with this thing as well. And 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 we have to remember that the that the uh, the Sony that we're talking about there is two or three times bigger than this camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you know, if if you you guys you you can't you can't take you can't add the iPhone to that because the iPhone is something you're going to have it anyway. You know, yeah. and the and and the, and the key is is that this is. By just by virtue that it's connected to your iPhone, it's connected to your Twitter account, your Facebook account, your Instagram account. It is part of your, you know, you can email stuff, you can do all of the things that you would do with your iPhone, except that you have this great camera attached to it. And so it's more than 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 a than a point and shoot in that way, and it's smaller, you know. And, and so and and I really like I I looked at all of these cameras, and this is the first one that I've had. Like I just carry it around all the time, and it's just like this little add-on rather than. And, it's take, and the reason is because it doesn't have to do the LCD, and we also have to remember that it's also a this is the first version um, you know we they can be updating the software at any point in time and adding more features because mm -hmm. the, the hard part is getting a great lens and a, and, a, um, and a sensor telling that lens and sensor what to do you know that's the app you know and so the app can be constantly updated through the iTunes store and there's not like a, a weird firmware thing or anything else it's just an update you know and, and now I've got new you know new features whatever those new features that they want to add those those features will be added seamlessly without a lot of work on my end so yeah and the firmware in the camera itself when they update yeah. the software the, that, the software updates the firmware of the camera so right. it's it just sort of works and you don't have to like okay i need to put the firmware update on the chip and <laughs> copy in there. copy the dlt file yeah. from this and then put it over there and then push these two buttons and then right. do this thing and, and yeah then and then rub it and patting your head and, and then oh you got it wrong so now your camera is a brick you know, you know, you know. So, you know. <laughs> oh, you forgot to charge your battery while you were doing this. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, the you know, when it, looking at the size of that thing, I think one of the I'm going to try using it instead of my key, my digital key. I'm just going to put it on my key ring if I get one of those. And could. carry it on. You know, I I take the car keys out the door, and I've got a camera with me. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Frederick, and it's remarkably durable. The one thing I would say is that is that the uh, the funny thing was is that when I first got it, I was like, oh, and I had to wrap it up in something all the time, and I really wanted something. And by the third or fourth day, you're just like throwing it in your pocket. You're like, yeah, whatever. You know, like it's fine. It it it, it really works. You know, and, and it really just, put a lot of work into the industrial design on this thing. Because yeah, you I was the same way, Alex. Because it's a high ticket item, right? You're like, really? oh, oh, and it's op it's precision optics. And you're like, yeah. okay, let me let me baby my little you know, precious jewel, you know. But after a while, you're like, it's like your keys. You throw yes. it around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's exactly, it's, it's funny. Like it. so, so you guys both have talked about this. Frederick, what what, what is super raw? How, how, they have raw files. We, we're familiar with what those are, but what is super raw? Super raw is interesting. Uh, and it, so basically what it is, in a nutshell, is it's kind of like HDR. So we're all familiar with HDR, where you take multiple exposures so that you can increase your your uh, the uh, the latitude, you know, or the the data that you have in the highlights and the exposures across a range, and you can push that to get like Trey Radcliffe kind of artistic interpretations of that, or you can use it for art for architectural purposes, where you want to say get a scene of a house 
from outside and have the interior look exposed, you know, be exposed correctly and the outside lighting be correct. That takes multiple shots to do that, and that's HDR. HDR stands for high dynamic range. With, uh, with Super Raw, what DxO has done is they do a similar thing where the camera takes multiple images, but instead of doing the, the latitude kind of magic, it looks at the deltas of noise between the images. So as noise changes between those, those multiple exposures, it, the computer knows or the software knows that that noise is noise and ejects it. So what you end up with is a really high resolution, high bit depth, noise-free or relatively noise-free image. And that's, that's their super raw concept. All right, so this is a little bit similar to, in a lot of our cameras, uh, where we have long exposure noise reduction. You know, and it'll, take a, it'll take a one minute shot and then it'll do a one minute exposure with the shutter closed and it will figure out what the noise is and yeah. subtract the noise from the thing. So it's a little bit similar. Kind of like that, yeah. It, does, it, does it actually take separate exposures in that, is it not appropriate for a moving subject? Yes, it does, and and no, it's not. So you're not going to you're not going to be shooting sports per se in Super Raw because it's you know it's taking three rapid succession images uh, and then doing the math on those. But you know most scenes like street photography or and it, and it does it pretty well. Uh, you know I've done it at a, at a um, for instance at a dinner table with somebody, and it's been enough that it will um, take take a picture of them well. You know, mm-hmm. if they're not moving, you know, they're not moving around and talking. They're just smiling, and you're taking a photo in a dark. You know, it, it doesn't have to be uh, a landscape only. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it does a pretty good job of that. Um, anyway, I, I've been kind of surprised at how well it works. We use similar techniques at ILM to do matte paintings, where we would take we would take a whole bunch of film shots of, of something and, and do a temporal uh, noise reduction. Um, we didn't call it that, which is much their their term is much better. <laughs> we we yeah. stacked a bunch of images together to do that, and um uh, uh but to do the same thing, but we had to have it perfect, so we had to correct everything because we'd have gate um uh um vibr- you know gate changes you know with with we were actually taking film and scanning it and it's very old fashioned. Yeah, we were getting- I, I'll tell you this this would look pretty silly on top of a you know a five pound tripod. Handheld. Put it on there. Put it on there with a geared head, and the whole thing is going to look really strange. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do that. You know, I'm, I've been known to build crazy rigs for things. So I, I <laughs> yeah. Well, I know, Doug. I know you're going to get into uh, you know some of the what don't we like about the camera, but that's that's one of the things that I think is missing, and that's just a threaded tripod yeah. slot on the thing. You know, on the bottom, they didn't put one on there for some reason. I know you could clamp it and use like you know a Joby you know, whatever the mini iPhone holders are out there, and it's not that heavy, so it will it will counterbalance nicely. But on this thing, I just, you know, it seems like it should have a tripod hole on there so that I how can... About a, how about a rubber band? You've, by the way, you've got a Joby Museum over your shoulder. I know. They're multiplying. There were only three there yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, even want to, I, I don't even want to know how that happened. That's yeah, all. Really. That's, yeah, that's that Papa be. Bear, Mama Bear, and a couple of baby bears back there. <laughs> Alex, I, you know, see, it's you're rubbing off on me when something works. Uh, I rinse and repeat. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. I, you know, we, we've got a couple of jobies laying around. <laughs> yeah, I so know. I, you know, I'm looking. I'm looking at the specs. I want to make sure we cover everything. We don't, I don't think we actually mentioned that it is a 20 megapixel camera. That it, we did say it's a one inch sensor. So of course, everybody calls their sensors one inch, even though they aren't. So who knows what it really is. Yeah. Um, one thing I notice is it's got a lot of controls. You've got scene modes, you've got PASM, which is you know program mode, aperture, uh, shutter priority, manual. You've got different metering modes and focusing modes. What happens when you use this off of the iPhone? Um, can you set up uh, some of them a, a mode, and will that mode be sticky in the camera if you disconnect it from the iPhone, uh, Frederick? That's a great question. Um, on the back of the camera, I'm going to turn mine on here. Uh, on the back of the camera, when it's not connected, uh, it has. Let's see if you can see this. Let's see if it focuses. But this little screen that you see is a capacitive touch screen, so you can s- basically swipe through the controls on it. But when you're swiping, it essentially, I think it's going to go into the last mode that you had set on the I, phone. I, like right now, my phone was set to auto mode, so it's a, it says auto. On there. I think I think Alex may have the answer, and yeah. I think I, and I'm not certain. I think it's in auto mode all the time when it's when Is it's it? not on the okay. phone. I, I don't think I've ever seen it do anything other than auto when I when I don't have it connected to the iPhone, and I typically have it on aperture priority or you know that type of thing. So I've never seen it not do auto um, on that. 
And then on that screen on the back, like I was swiping, if you want to, you can swipe and basically go into video mode, and it puts a little video there, so you can shoot video from there without the phone attached. But again, that's an opportunity for them as developers to add whatever they want. Right now, there's only two modes here. Who's to say there won't be three, four, five later? You know, exactly. So, yeah. So DxO is not a company that comes to mind immediately when we think of cameras, Frederick. Uh, you know, DxO does a few things. One is we probably a lot of us who do reviews know them for their sensor database and their sensor ratings. Yeah. Uh, they also have some very sophisticated software having to do with sensors. I don't even know what it does. Frederick, who's DxO and why are they in this business? Well, I mean, that's that's interesting. I mean, that's a question for DxO, but <laughs> I'll do my best. Yeah, but they're not here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they make software. You know, they make the DxO Optics Pro. I'm mean, looking at my notes here. DxO Optics Pro and the DxO Film Packs. And they're they're sort of famous for this sort of high level of image quality. And then the other thing is that they're kind of known for is the DxO Marks uh, score, where they rate cameras in the industry. Um, part of that, I think part of... And again, many challenges when you bring out a new camera, <laughs> especially when you are you've sort of built up a reputation of evaluating competition's cameras is is uh, evaluating your own camera versus them. So they applied when you apply your DxO Mark score to your own device, it becomes suspect. You know, so they got a lot of, I think they're getting a little bit of flack from some people online, not a lot, but they gave their the DxO Mark score of this camera a 70 in RAW and up to 85 in Super RAW, which they say is comparable and exceeds some DSLRs, and some people are crying foul about that. So, you know, time will, time will tell. And I think they, you know, the, the, and the thing to, to look at is that they also are, I mean, it's not just that they rate these things, they build hardware that most of these camera manufacturers use to look at their own Mm -hmm. um, optics yeah. and so on and so forth. So, they're in, in in an odd way. I mean, we've never heard of. I mean, not I mean, anybody who hasn't doesn't have their software, or doesn't read all these reviews, may not have heard of them. But they're actually the perfect company to do this because they're they are the ones that have been. They know what makes a good. You know, they've been measuring chips and optics for you know quite some time, and so they really know what that needs to look like. Um, I think that they probably applied the same. Re, you know, they know how to. They know how to make their score go really well because they do the scores, <laughs> so that yeah. is the advantage. Right. But 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 the other manufacturers all have the, uh, their tools as well. I mean, they see these things too. They they could you know look at how they're going to rate you know um, on a on a DxO Mark um, you know system because they can buy that hardware. They can build that lab that the DxO has that tests all these things. So yeah. so I think that it's not that they you know they they happen to do it. They know it from the inside, but it's not that they have tools that that they're not selling to. To other manufacturers. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd, I'd hate to see a world where uh, Google was in the business of selling search engine optimization services. <laughs> that, that that would not be a good thing. I hope there's not a startup out there that's actually secretly funded by Google. That would. Uh, be. I know. I know. Um, yeah. Frederick, you've you've twice now mentioned the industrial design, and mm -hmm. you give us you give us a little look at you know how the thing. It almost worked for you. It worked better for Alex. Uh, well, I got to work it now. Yeah, just it's not their fault. I had it. I had the little rotational thing here turned. So look, it works now. But, but in a, in a in a perfect world, you wouldn't have been able to make that mistake. That's uh, right. T tell me, what what is it about the design of this that really appeals to you? When I first saw this thing, it uh, you know, and I told them this, everything from from the way, just the fit and finish of it, how how it feels solid, doesn't creak. You know, it feels like a it feels like a tool rather than a toy. You know, like some of the other, like the, the Sony, the QX series, those were cool, but they felt plasticky and toy-y, you know. They felt like, they didn't feel like I could hammer a nail with it. <laughs> you know, this, this, I feel like if I was stupid, I could hammer a nail with it, <laughs> and, and it, would, it would probably survive. Uh, it's just well designed. And I told those, I told the, uh, uh, when, uh, the folks when I got this that it felt like, it kind of feels like something that Apple might have designed. Right, so which a lot of people say that about things, you know, Apple is like the king of industrial design and all this stuff. But when you look at this and you look at the packaging and how they put it together and the unboxing experience and just how it all works together, it kind of has this feel of someone or a series of someone's put a lot of brain hours into every little nuance, everything from like how the words are written on here to the gap between the little door where the SD 
all this stuff, it just feels really well made and not like it's thrown together and we'll see if the market likes it. And if the market likes it, we'll refine it. You know, it feels like they decided to build a, a, a shipping version with their version one that they can just build on that and iterate. Yeah, and and the um, and the connector is quite a thing. You know, the the connector that they built, um, you know, it's it is uh, you know not only does it you know pop out, but it also will release. So if you have your iPhone and you twist it too far, it's going to pop out of the iPhone. You know, it's going to pop out of the phone. It's not going to break it, which is the first thing that I worried about. <laughs> Turning it around and moving it around, it's it's a pretty durable thing. It'll it'll actually get. You can actually just push it in as well. Um, um, so so you you don't have you can force it if you want to. I, I don't do it because I. <laughs> so you know, so but but uh, yeah. so when we when we, you know we we look back, I'm just thinking back to the Sony QX10, QX100, and they're really very different beasts because of this connector. You know, those devices connected over Wi-Fi, and that was an extremely painful process and unstable. You you'd have it connected, so, and then and then you if you're in a heavy Wi-Fi area, you lose the connection to your lens, right. you or, know, you know or it times out if you don't use it for you know. 30 seconds, a minute, whatever it was, the connection would time out. You'd have to go back into your iPhone settings. You'd have to go to all that trouble. Now, yeah. there's there's one other device out there. I don't know if either of you have seen it. I have not yet, other than reviews. That's the Olympus Air. It's a, a different beast altogether, um, but this is another device that people might want to look at. I hope we get to look at it on an upcoming episode of All About the Gear. The, the Olympus Air is a complete camera with, again, no screen, no LCD, no controls really to speak of. It requires an iPhone or an Android device. But it also doesn't include a lens. Instead, it has a micro four-thirds mount. Mm. So you can take any micro four-thirds lens, including a little pancake-type lens or a, you know, a 300 millimeter, and put it on this little cylindrical body that looks like a QX10, and again, use the iPhone or an Android phone to control it. So a uh, different case. Have either of you seen that device or worked with it? I, I've seen some photos of it, but I, I haven't I haven't had a chance to actually get my hands on it yet. And, um, and I, I haven't had to play with it yet. I, you know, I think that, the again, the wireless... Interestingly enough, I, I would like to see a wireless connection in the DX01 so that I had the, the freedom to do that yeah, yeah. Uh, when I want to, um, but, but having to be the only way to connect is something that I'm not as excited about. Yeah. yeah. One yeah, thing I, sure. I want to try when when Frederick buys me lunch and lets me play with his camera because I, I I'm not going to run out and buy one of these things, but I do want to play with it. Yeah. But Frederick, I want you to uh, see how easily it is to get an image from the camera to the iPhone to your Fuji printer. Oh, okay. Right? Because yeah. that's an interesting use case again for this you know very high portability. Uh, Alex, you know you spend a lot of time in Africa. When I travel. Uh, especially to third world countries, I love taking a portable printer with me or a camera with you know instant film so that I can give pictures to people on the street. Yep. And, yeah, and, uh, and it's it's instant. You know, I mean yeah, I, I, we, we have it I have it it's as fast as the printer will print. I mean I have an Epson uh, portable printer and uh, that, that we have in Africa and the you know it's the connect the Wi Fi as if you were doing from I you know because within seconds after you take the photo or a so have you have you tried it with the DX01 going to the printer? I've done it from the iPhone. I haven't I haven't okay. done it from the DX01. Yeah, so I want to I want to you know give a test to, uh, to look and see mm -hmm. what that flow is like to go from the DX01 connected to the iPhone and then from there to the printer and see how seamless that might be. It will be. be I can tell you it will be it's it, it will be just like shooting with your iPhone right. because when you shoot with the DXO it records to your camera roll, right? So yeah. basically with with the Fuji SP1 you take a photo with your camera, in this case with the DX01, then you launch the Fuji app and pick the photo. Well, you connect to the, the Wi-Fi network that the Fuji has created, pick the photo, and send it. That's it. Yeah. And then well, it I know Fuji, Fuji's in the camera business, but I'd rather see them publish an API so that something like the DXO app could go directly to the printer. You that shouldn't would have good. to hop from one to the other. Of course, yeah. I know when I got Alex on the show that anytime I talk about open APIs, I've got a I've got an ally on that one. <laughs> well, yeah, and and I, and it's the one thing that it's another thing that I'd like to see from the DXO is is I think that their app is great. So I think that the, it's fantastic. Um, I would like to see them open up the camera to other. Um, developers within the iPhone, you know, so so if I want to use Periscope or Meerkat, or if I want to use, um, you know, or if I if someone wants to develop something very specialized, you know, I have, you know, a lot of us that do photography have very special, you know, needs that may not make sense for a large market to develop for, 
but what if we could develop an app that does very good, very complicated HDRs or time lapse or other things? Now maybe DxO is going to go that direction anyway, but but I think that there's an opportunity to allow a market to develop for your hardware. They don't have to give much up that would destabilize the hardware. It's just literally tell us what you want to do with the shutter, the aperture. The, you know, you could, you could, it could be a very simple API. Um, that doesn't get deep, dig deep into the camera, but just gives um, developers an opportunity to take advantage of the camera. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that you know that along with wireless uh, are two of the big things that I'd, I'd love to see. I know that the, their big thing is the lightning connector, but but there's also times where you want to be able to set this thing somewhere and control it from your phone. You know, like that's the uh, you know. So I do know notice that that's something that I would like to have occasionally. Yeah. Especially you're doing video of yourself, like again in that YouTube. Scenario. It would be great to be able to put this thing if it had a tripod slot. Put yeah. it, or, you know, put it on a tripod. Compose your your shot with your iPhone. You know, and then hit record and roll away. When you're done, throw it in your pocket and you're off. Right. It's perfect. So. All right. So we're getting to the end of this show. I want to do one thing. Uh, full disclosure. I want you guys. How did you come to get this camera? Uh, did you buy this? Did you get it from DXO, Frederick? How did you get no. it? So I got it from DxO. They they had a program, or they have a program, where they gave a series or a group of these cameras out to you know, photographers to test pre-release. So basically, when they gave me the camera, I was in photographer mode and not in I run the Twip network mode. <laughs> so so the whole thing's under you know embargo, all the secrecy and all this stuff. So I was able to get it early, you know, as using photographer Frederick as my persona instead of media guy as my persona. That's how about you, Alex? How did you come through it the same way? I got it. Well, I got it. We're doing a little, we are in full disclosure doing a little work with, uh, with uh, DxO. So we're, so I I have it to to test. So, okay, good. So the last question then is if you didn't have one, would you go out and buy one? Frederick? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Yeah. That's the the equivalent of our classic, who's this for, but I'm just going to say, is it for Frederick? It's, see, that's interesting. That's, just, that's a similar question to would I buy this, this Apple Watch, right? Because on the one hand, you don't really need an Apple Watch, you know? And on the other, you know, if you're a photographer, you probably have all, you could take photos that this thing can take already, but it, it's a new category. So it's hard to answer that question because it's a brand new category and it solves some issues that we kind of didn't know we had, like the portability thing and all that. So and with the watch, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's, it appeals to the early adopter side of me. And same with this thing. The more I use the DxO1 and the more that they refine, you know, all the features in there, I find myself grabbing this instead of any, any of the other cameras that I have for just the quick around town trips and that kind of thing. If I'm going to go do a model shoot or something for a client or something, of course, I'm going to bring one of my, my Lumix cameras or something like that or, you know, something more heavyweight. But... Instead of just bringing my iPhone, I'm bringing my iPhone and the, the DxO one now. Now, now to answer your question, would I buy it? I would think about it because that the the price point for me is it's right on the edge of you know I could buy a lens with that money you know so it's it's right on the edge of that. But I don't know. I might save for a couple more weeks and get it. You know who knows? Uh, Alex, how about you? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I mean, here, the thing is, is that I I am. I mean, I've been talking about this for years. I am yeah. the 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 perfect. Uh, use case for the DxO. I have lots of SLRs. I have lots of point and shoot cameras. I mean, so, someone asked me how many cameras there are, like 50 or 60 cameras laying around, and and I don't carry any of them with me because I travel too much. You know, well, I carry some of them. I have little little ones, but but the um, but I it was just and I couldn't get the quality that I wanted. And and I won't say that it's perfect right now. You know, I think that there's lots of little things that I'd like to see, but I have to say that I carry it every day in my front pocket. I'm able to just pull it out and take pictures, and it's really, um, you know, I I feel like there was this lost time when I really stopped taking my SLR, where the, the pictures of my kids were my iPhone, and I just look at them and I go, that was an amazing photo. That would have been a little better if I had had something better. And now I have that, you know. And yeah. some of the pictures I've taken of my kids specifically, um, and some of my travel photos have just been stunning. And my number one complaint about, you know, fo- cameras in general is low light. You know, I need to see, I, I, I take photos, I don't like flash. I, I just don't like flashes. Yeah. So I want natural light. I want to be able to just grab it as a photojournalist style. I'm going to just grab onto whatever I'm looking at. Um, I don't want people to really think about it, all those things. And so having great low light performance has been probably the biggest, that along with the fast connection and being able to post things, it's, it's amazing. So one other, one other cool thing that I want to throw in there is for a nuance for, for folks to kind of get their brain around is 
you know, we're used to using our iPhones to take shots, and we have these amazing apps in here, like, you know, like I mentioned, Snapseed, and, you know, it goes on and on. There's all these cool apps that are just professional-level apps that you have in here that you're kind of restricted to using the built-in optics in the iPhone to, to use the photos that you take. Now, imagine if you could take a 20-megapixel photo with this thing and throw it into Snapseed, and now things get really interesting because now you can really create some usable art, you know, not to say that you couldn't with the iPhone camera alone, but things get interesting when you get more data in there to play around with. So that's, that's kind of a critical little nuance there. And if you're a blogger looking at this, this is, this is the camera. Like I'm just saying, you know, like if you're, you know, traveling around, you want some, you know, you want portability, you want to be able to take photos wherever you're at or any, you know, if you're a photo journal, you know, you're working in news, you're working in as a blogger, you're working in those types of things. I mean, there's people like me that just want to have a, you know, artistically want something better, but this is the camera for that, for that market. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great, well, very, it's a great very good. I'm I'm going to remain the skeptic here, but that's because I don't have one. And this way, maybe I can get a free <laughs> lunch out of it uh, over at uh, T Rex in Berkeley, Frederick. We'll, we'll this, do that. But next time we have lunch, I'll put this in your uh, hands. All right, because I want to I want to see if uh, there's really any reason to have this in addition to the iPhone. I'm awfully impressed with my iPhone camera. Yep. Well, I want to thank you both, Alex. Great to see you. It's been a long, long time since I've seen you either in person or on screen, huh? It's good to see you too. We have to. We have to get all to get. Three of us have to get together. For we, oh, we should do that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Great to see you. And Frederick, always good to see you. And I look forward to having you back on the show. Also seeing you on Twip as well. Likewise. Thanks for having me on, Doug. Okay. And uh, uh, thanks everybody for listening and watching. And we'll see you again on another episode of All About the Gear.